welcome to another virtual edition of Texas Public Radio's Storyteller Series. I'm Andrea Vocap Sanderson, and this is worth repeating. Tonight's episode features a selection of stories from your friends and neighbors in San Antonio about a time they had to choose between fight or flight. Let's get started. Jackie Velez always had to work harder than most to achieve her goals. When life put yet another major obstacle in her path, she had to summon the strength to win a battle she never in a million years thought she'd have to fight. Amputee. That's a word that I never thought I'd have to associate myself with in my entire life. I was born with spina bifida, so I'm already disabled, and I was already used to disability, disabled, handicapped. Those are words that I could associate myself with. And being disabled, I had to work twice as hard to achieve even the most basic goals. I was a non-traditional student at University of the Incarnate Word, and I had to really, really, really work so hard to, to get the grades that I had. I was a senior. I had so many things going for me at that time. I was in doing the newspaper, uh, our, our television uh, broadcast, and I was going to intern for a magazine, and I was one semester away from graduating. So I had so many things going for me. And then I was told that I needed to have an amputation. My right foot needed to be amputated because it was infected and the bone was infected. And so that devastated me so much to have to put everything that I worked so hard for on hold because of that. I remember when I was checking into the hospital and I had to endure 13 days worth of occupational therapy and physical therapy, physical therapy being the most excruciating, painful therapy ever. And I remember having this therapist telling me, you can smile, you need to smile more before we can start our exercises. In my head, I was so devastated at the fact that I had my right foot amputated that I was like, no, hell no. I don't have anything to smile about. I'm away from my family, I'm away from my friends. I have to put on my internship on hold. I have nothing to smile about. And I just felt like, I, I just didn't want to exist anymore. So one night, I, I, I was up late at night, and I was just crying because I couldn't believe that this had happened to me. What evil could I have possibly done to make this happen? And I just didn't want to exist anymore. I didn't want to live. I just wanted everything to stop. That night, a friend of mine called me. She video chatted me. And I told her, I said, I can't. I, I'm not, I don't want to do this. I, I'm just not with it today. I'm not feeling myself. I'm not, I'm not doing well. And she said, you know what? I'm going to stay on the phone with, with you until you're okay. And we talked all night. I don't even remember what we talked about, but the point is, is that she was there, there for me. So that night I took into consideration everything that had happened and realized that I had people rooting for me and wanting me to come home. So that day I decided, all right, I could either fold or I could do what I do best, which is focus on the goal at hand. So focusing on that goal, that specific goal was to exercise and to get myself back, not to the same place I was at, but as normal as I could possibly be, to live my life without that foot that I relied on for so many years, to transfer from my car, from my wheelchair, to a car or a bathroom or just a regular seat. And so I had to retrain my brain. 13 days of grueling pain to rewire not only my brain, but to rewire my entire body so that I could transfer from one place to another to get from point A to point B. It was the most exhausting physical and occupational therapy I had ever had. By the end of that, I was able to go home and I was able to transfer to my sister's car. I was able to come and transfer to my bed. 
I use a transfer board now, something I had never used before in my entire life. But I use it now. It's a sliding board, and so I have to go from point A to point B. And that's the thing that I have come to rely on. And, and I've thought about it, and it's okay to be able to rely on things. If it helps you become as independent as you possibly can. And I have my friends, and I have my family, and I graduated with two, two degrees, two BA degrees. And now I can safely say that I can smile again, knowing that I have my life back, or at least as normal as it possibly can be. And that I have my family and friends to support me. And that's what matters most. Starting 20 years ago in his spare time, Johnny Hellams has been writing down stories from his life in a composition notebook. He plans to leave the notebook to his daughters to remember him by. He's never shared these stories with anyone, except for the story you're about to hear, about the time he found himself squaring off against a familiar foe. It was the spring of 1963. I just turned five years old that January. It was a Monday morning. And it was the sound of the shotgun going off is what woke me up. See, I looked out my bedroom window just in enough time to see my dad's old fighting rooster jumping around without his head. My brother Sammy was standing there with the Pops old 410 shotgun. See, there were eight of us kids in the family. There were six boys and two girls, but out of six boys, Sammy was the only one that got a kick out of killing stuff, I suppose. Not that this old rooster didn't deserve it. That bird was evil. See, my dad, everyone that knew him called him Pop, uh, including us kids. See, every once in a while, Pop would cage up that old rooster and take him down to the banks of Tenny Creek. Tenny Creek was a spring-fed creek. I, I don't know where it started or ended, but it ran through the back half of our 55 acres and on through the neighbor's place. But anyway, Pop would take that old rooster down and he'd meet up with other folks that had roosters and they'd let them roosters fight. I'm sure other folks would show up too, you know, if you ones that wanted to place a wager or maybe they just wanted to see a rooster fight. But my guess is that, that Pop always did pretty good with his rooster because he always came home with him. It was a Monday morning and I was tired and I was sleepy. Not because it was Monday. Is because the night before, the evening before, that Sunday, it was all out in the backyard with my folks and my brother Morgan, who's 16 years my elder, and myself. We were all out there. I don't, I don't know what they were talking about, but but I'm thinking they're, they were probably talking about the new chicken pen Pop was building there in the backyard, the new smokehouse. We had a smokehouse there. Pop killed a hog every winter. But anyway, they were out there talking, and and I had a, a bat towel clipped to the collar of my shirt. I'd got a bat towel out of the closet in the house, and I'd snatched a couple of clothespins off the clothesline, and I had that bat towel clipped to my collar and the towel going down my back like a cape. I was flying around like I was Superman. I was flying all around. I was zipping around. I was zipped around the corner of the whale house. We had a whale house that sat kind of catty-cornered from my bedroom there. Yeah, I zipped around the corner of that well house, and I come face to face with that rooster. I stopped. We just kind of stared at each other for a minute. All of a sudden, that rooster's neck stretched out, his old chest bowed out, and his wings went to flapping. That rooster was going to come after me. I knew I had to run. That rooster wanted me to die. So I turned, and I broke, and I run. That rooster jumped up on me, jumped up on my leg. I could feel him trying to dig his spurs through the breeches of my leg of my pants, trying to get into my skin. I turned around and I tried to give him a good kick, but he jumped and I missed. So he was still coming. I turned around and I broke as hard as I could toward that back door, and he was still coming. You know, you just never know how fast a rooster is until one of them's chasing you. But that rascal, he was chasing me, he was chasing me. I turned and looked, and he just kept gaining on me. And the next thing you know, I step off in one of those post holes Pop was digging for that new chicken pen, and I face planted. I spit out dirt. I spit out blood from my busted lip. I spit out grass. I was crying. 
That rooster jumped up on me. He jumped up on my back. He jumped up on my head. He was trying his best to dig his talons into my skull. He was slapping me on the side of the face with his wings. I was crying. I was hollering. Just about as quick as that rooster got there, that rooster was gone. My brother Morgan, I don't know if he kicked that rooster off. I don't know if he shooed him away. I don't know if he pushed him off. But he got that killer chicken off of me. He reached down and he picked me up. Worked my leg out of that post hole. My leg was broke. I was crying. They carried me in the house. See, it was a Sunday evening and the chances of finding medical attention on a Sunday evening uh, was pretty slim. And my dad was a farmer and uh, did some carpenter work and we lived a pretty modest life and didn't have a lot of money for extras. So it was decided that we'd wait till, till Monday morning to get me to the doctor. It was a long night. It was a long night. But they got me to the doctor early that morning. Uh, somebody carried me out to the truck. Uh, my brother Morgan carried me out to the truck. Uh, my pop had an old Chevy pickup that was a farm truck. And when he had a carpenter job, he'd used it as a, as a work truck. But they carried me to the doctor. Uh, we lived about 20 miles out of town, but they got me to, they got me to the doctor and got a new cast put on my leg. I fell asleep on the way home. Uh, well, it was about 20 miles out of town, so I fell asleep on the way home. I can't remember who carried me in the house and put me in the bed, uh, but I slept most of, the, most of the day, just waking up every once in a while. I, I woke up when the shotgun went off, that's for sure. Uh, but I'd wake up occasionally, you know, just trying to adjust my leg, just trying to get used to that new cast. Uh, but I, I slept. Uh, but that later that evening, uh, my sister came into the room, my sister Kathy. She came over to bed and gave me a little shake, you know, and I woke up. I looked at her. She looked at me. She smiled. She was always smiling. Kathy's always smiling. She still smiles. Love my sister Kathy. She gave me a little shake. Looked at her and she goes, Johnny, you want some chicken and dumplings? Beth DeVilliers knows when the storm is brewing, the clock is ticking. Extreme weather may be unpredictable, but the decision they obligate is the same. Should we ride it out or run? Growing up in southwest Louisiana, just 30 minutes from the coast and a couple of miles away from a major refinery, I definitely have had my fair share of fight or flight moments. Whether it was a hurricane barreling towards us or a major leak at the refinery, our family always had to be prepared. Um, we always had a stockpile of wood in the yard for the fireplace a ton of batteries and flashlights, and even more candles just in case power would go out. Visqueen to seal the windows and the doors if there were also a chemical leak at the plant, and filling the bathtubs with water before a major storm were a regular occurrence to us, so it seemed pretty normal. The decision to stay or leave during a hurricane, especially if there were a mandatory evacuation issued, was heavily weighed between the family. If we were to stay, we could protect the house from further damage. If windows or doors blow out, then it could possibly make the house implode in the pressure change of the hurricane. And also you have the issue of looters after the hurricane and stealing all of our valuable property. So we had to weigh that with the personal safety of ourselves and our family and our pets whenever there were any storm coming and the storm could change in a moment. The uncertainty of it, of not knowing how long you would have to be gone or how long you may be out of power if you stay, is very unnerving. So we always made these decisions as a family in the most level-headed way and so I'm pretty used to performing under those kinds of pressure and staying prepared. So when the winter storm was coming our way, all of these things ran through my mind, but the difference was the fact that this was a different type of weather pattern that I've ever had to go through, 
and also not having the rest of my family here. My partner has never really been through anything like this before and wanted to ride it out, kind of saw it as an adventure and I felt differently. I felt like we were not prepared enough and in my intuition, I just felt like this was different. I felt like this was not going to be the fun camp out, hunkered down in the bedroom with the dogs and candles lit, lighting the room. I just had a feeling that it was going to be very different. And with the added stress of the pandemic and having to navigate going to a warming shelter in the middle of COVID with five dogs and a rabbit, I just did not have the fight in me that I would normally have during a major weather event or that I have had in the past. So the Saturday before the storm, temperatures were already beginning to drop outside. It was already getting painfully cold in our house. We have a house from the 20s, tall ceilings, original windows that are incredibly drafty and only space heaters and only the amount of space heaters that the breakers will allow us to run at once. So I just knew that we needed to get out and seek the help that our friend had offered to us in his house that has central and also is just better insulated. So we made the decision to leave. We packed a small car load with our belongings, our dogs, our rabbit, and the valuables that we didn't want to leave behind just in case anyone should notice that the house was vacant and break in. And we headed to our friend's house where we spent the next five days, thankfully never lost power or water. And it was the best decision that we have ever made because upon returning home five days later, so the Friday after we left, there was still ice in our kitchen sink Every plant that I own, both outdoor and indoor, was dead. And our neighbor said that it got down to 17 degrees in his house, so probably pretty similar in ours. And had we decided to stay and ride the storm out as some sort of adventure, the outcome may have been very different. And we are now able to move forward, repairing a few things on the house and also beginning to rebuild my plant collection. Dolores Godinez has lived many lives. Today, she's a photographer in San Antonio. In her 20s, she was an actress in Dallas. In her 40s, she was a tutor, which led her to an adventure in Florida that stayed with her for the rest of her life. So, it was gonna be my adventure. I mean, I was going through what is called middle-aged crazy. I had been working in Dallas as a, a tutor and independent contract jobs and I really needed a vacation. So I applied for a winter job, temporary, in Florida, and I got the job. I was so excited. I was gonna be a tutor teacher to some students that were going to be at an equestrian festival. And I drove, I got in my car and took what I needed and drove straight from Dallas to Florida. Slept a few winks here and there, but I just wanted to get there. I get to the town and it's everything I wanted it to be. It was gonna be my working vacation. We were um, on the grounds of the equestrian festival. Uh, there was a tutoring teacher posh trailer. And so it was exciting. I had two months there. I found myself a studio, which was a little higher price than I thought, but I said, hey, I'll make up for it with my uh, savings or with my uh, pay paycheck. So the first month was exactly what I dreamed. I was working a lot. There were cute little kids coming in from the age of five to the age of 17, ready to get schooled in language arts and history and whatever I could help them with. And in between times, 
I would walk out into the festival grounds and I would see horses in the barns and I would flirt with some of the trainers. It was awesome. And I would catch some competitions sometimes of my students. It was a dream. And then the bottom fell out of my dream in the second month. Suddenly, um, a lot of the students were going home and we weren't getting enough contracts, which was a problem <laughs> because I had to send some money back to Dallas to pay for my apartment in Dallas. And so I couldn't afford that studio. So I thought, well, hey, no problem. I'll find something else, but I have to move out and I have my car. It'll be, it'll be fun, an adventure. So I moved into my car and the first couple of nights were a little scary, but because I'd never been in my car at night, but I um, parked behind a very famous coffee shop and I thought, okay, as long as nobody, nobody tells me to move along, I'll be all right. So I stayed the night, the next couple of days. In the mornings, I would go into the coffee shop, buy the cheapest cup of coffee, go into their bathroom, clean up, change clothes, put on makeup, ready to go. I'd go to the trailer and tutor my students. The daytimes were easy. I could blend in. I could walk around the barns at the festival. The nighttimes were harder. A couple of times I was in front of a fast food joint. I was at a, a big brick and mortar store. And then the days became weeks. And I did not realize that Florida gets really cold in the winter. And it got really cold in my car. I decided to go ahead and, and, and park at the festival grounds. I felt safer there. What the heck? I decided, because I was cold, that I could maybe sneak in to the tutoring trailer just for a couple of nights. And I was just, I, I, I'm honest, I wasn't going to take anything. I just wanted to sleep on the bean bags for a few hours. First night, no problem. It was so nice and warm. Next day, I actually had a contract uh, with a child whose parents were renting a fine mansion. I mean, a beautiful house. I walk in and I'm teaching her and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, maybe I could ask him if I could stay one night on that couch. And then I said, of course not, I can't ask that. So the next night I go back to the trailer and sleep a couple of winks. And as I'm leaving, as I opened the door, I ran into the boss and I froze. And she stared at me and she says, what are you doing here? What are you doing in the trailer? And I fell apart and I tried to explain and she got this hard look on her face and she said, you can't be here. My clients do not want me to have someone who is homeless working here. She gave me a blanket and told me, don't do that again. I was able to continue working and I wanted to finish my contract. I could have gone home, but I, I wanted to finish my contract. The next morning, I find out that everybody knows Boss has freaked out and is saying she can't believe she hired a homeless person. A teacher comes up to me and says, why didn't you tell me I could help you? And I said, I was ashamed. I moved in with this teacher to finish the contract. I go back to Dallas. I wanted to forget that time. No more. I moved to San Antonio. And sometimes I see people without shelter and I give them a couple of bucks. And as I walk away, 
I think, I know you. I know you. There's one thing that sticks with me that I wish didn't, but it does. I have a recurring nightmare. And the nightmare started when I was sleeping in the car in Florida. I wake up, I startle myself awake, and my father is standing in front of the car. And he has such a look of sadness on his face. He's so sad. And he says, what happened? What happened? My dad has been dead many, many years. And all I could say is, Papi, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. End of my adventure. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this virtual edition of Texas Public Radio's Worth Repeating. More information about Worth Repeating and how to support Texas Public Radio is online at tpr.org. 